Good morning, and welcome to the Sunday mornings at the Marxist Library. But now that we're in the midst of a pandemic, we don't we no longer meet physically at the Nebel Proctor Marxist Library in Oakland, California. So welcome. Um, good morning to those folks on the West Coast. Good afternoon for those further east or further west. And even if you're further, further, um, good, e good evening. Um, this program, the Sunday mornings at, at the Marxist Library, has been going on for about a decade and a half. And it's put on by a group called the Institute for the Critical Study of Society, uh, the ICSS. And uh, the, the program committee is the one that that de develops these programs and I'm on that program. Um, we still support the physical library with, with our contributions and we look forward to someday going back to there physically, but right now we are coming to you via Zoom. And we meet every week religiously at Sunday, on Sunday mornings. <laughs> and this has been, been our tradition. Um, the group, the Institute for the Critical Study of Society has a political unity and the political unity that we have is a broad one, but it's within the tradition of Marxism. And our tagline um, is one that we take from Marx's 11th thesis on Feuerbach, that philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways. The point, however, is to change it. However, to listen to our programs, you don't have to be a Marxist. To even participate in our programs, you don't have to be a Marxist. We take a great pride in having a very large tent, inviting a broad range of progressive thought. As long as you aren't supporting US imperialism, you are more than welcome to come to our programs. And in fact, we encourage you to contact us and see if um, you might want to give a program yourself or um, recommend someone else to do a program. And Alan, could you just give us the information for a second on um, how people might contact us either to um, give us feedback or also to get on the subscription list so that you get a weekly announcement of what our program is. So Alan, could you help me out on that one? Sure, to get on our mailing list, you can send an email to info at icssmarks.org with a request to be put on our mailing list and we will put you on as soon as we can. So info at icssmarks.org. Okay, thank, thank you very much, Alan. Um, and so with that, I'd like to invite our speaker to stop for just a second, just in terms of a little bit in the background. Right now, it's a very critical day. There's actions happening in Turkey. Um, the streets of Haiti are full of people protesting against the Ill illegitimate government. And in Ecuador, right now, they're having a national election, and there's a possibility that the right-wing president, Lenin Moreno's government, will be replaced with a progressive government um, after the tradition of Rafael Correa. So a lot of things are happening right now in the world. But today here at the Sunday mornings at the Marxist Library, we're going to have our speaker is going to be Danny Shaw. And a longtime comrade of Danny's has been Gary Hicks. And uh, G Gary, would you be interested in um, introducing Danny or would you prefer that I, I do that? Um, I see Gary is muted. Um, if I don't hear from Gary in a moment, I'll just do the introduction. So I, I've known Danny through. Latin I'll do it. I'll do it, uh, Roger. Great, Gary. Thank you. Go ahead. Oh, okay. It won't take long because whoever wrote the blurb to this program literally said it all about, about Danny. I mean, it, it, it damn near wrote his autobiography. Um, it, it damn near pulled out of the files his police record. It just, <laughs> I mean, it did, a, it, it did a whole lot of things. 
and I, I would suggest that people go to the blurb and take a good and take a good look at it because Gary Hicks doesn't. If Gary Hicks starts talking about Danny Shaw, Danny Shaw is not going to get to present today. <laughs> so without further ado, Danny, you ready to go? Uh, okay, I'll just give a very thank you, Gary. Just give a very quick mention that Gary uh, that uh, D Danny teaches at the City College of New York and Caribbean and Latin American Studies. He's written a number of articles, six six books, and um, has a very distinguished academic, but even more important political career. And in addition to that, um, he has a number of other accolades to it to him, um, including. Um, he is a Golden Gloves boxer and twice fought for the New York City Championship at Madison Square Garden, which if you know anything uh, if about Golden, the Golden Gloves, that's kind of the method of the Golden Gloves um, competition. So Danny um, will be speaking on dope plus capitalism equals genocide. After that, we'll have a robust question and answer period and um, we're looking forward to everybody's comments and questions. And so Danny, go ahead, please unmute yourself. All right, the tech, the tech person had to unmute me. Um, yeah, uh, Gary and I were first introduced on a stage together uh, in 1995, I was en route to Cuba as part of an anti-imperialist uh, youth brigade and Gary was performing his poetry and we were performing together. So 1995 was like yesterday and here we are, we get younger every day and our revolutionary optimism increases every day. So an honor uh, to meet everybody. Um, I'm glad that Roger started with the international context. Um, Malcolm X had a quote a few decades back on this very day about the importance of the black liberation struggle linking to the international struggle. So certainly uh, all eyes are on Ecuador, uh, Haiti, and everything that's going on uh, at the international level. So I didn't choose this topic. Uh, this, this topic chose me uh, in life. Um, I have some slides I'll present in a second, but uh, in terms of understanding drugs and dope and their impact on our families, our communities, our class. Uh, it's something I couldn't see when I was real young. I couldn't make all the different socioeconomic and historical connections, but because of where I come from, um, you know, I consider myself to use the Gramscian term of an organic intellectual. I think when you look at George Jackson's writing or Huey P. Newton and Bobby Seale and, uh, Asada, so many of the Panthers, only they could formulate certain things the way they did because that's where they came from. And they were a reflection of that social reality and of that social class, whether it was the lumpen proletariat or the internal black colony as the Panthers uh, formulated it here in the US, they were reflecting on their reality. So this formulation, when I first heard the Panthers say it, I think it was more or less on their 50th anniversary about four or five years back, it really resonated because um, in that one formula, you're saying it all, capitalism plus dope equals genocide. And I've been in this journey. I remember it was in 2009 and I was at this wedding in uh, Colorado. And I remember uh, the US was up to their usual funny business in, in Iran with this color revolution, quote unquote, color revolution attempt in Iran. And I was at this uh, wedding all these liberal overtones and undertones about intervention in Iran. And, and I remember um, meeting different people there and I don't know how it came up, but it came up stuff about addiction in our families and sexual violence. And I remember just being very distracted at that wedding um, that weekend. And I was on a mission. That was 2009. I was on a mission. I wanted to understand the people closest to me. Uh, in my family. So it's been a, a long ideological mission. It's just getting started, really. Um, and I, I couldn't have done it without the mentors, um, you know, some of whom are, are, are here today. Um, the ongoing conversations with 
more experienced revolutionaries and in, in Marxists to make sense of um, everything around us, all of the insidiousness. So I grew up um, in some ways shielded slightly from the insidiousness, but in the midst of it, this stuff is very generational uh, as, as we'll get into. And that's one thing I had to realize too, the people on the very, very front lines of the addiction, whether that's my mother's generation or my grandmother's or my, my, my children, um, often it's tough for us to reflect directly on trauma in a macro sense. So the fact that I was maybe, uh, I didn't quite go through what my two older sisters went through, for example, or what my mother went through, somehow enabled me um, to take this intellectual step back and then for my family extrapolate to my class, to our society and understand that these social problems, whether it's gangs, um, violence in our streets, um, machismo, addiction, all of these things are woven into the very fabric of capitalism, of white supremacy, of imperialism. So that's kind of an intro to this, this topic. Let me get up into the, the slides. So I wanted to start off with this very empowering image here of the Rainbow Coalition, which really never got a chance to um, get off the ground. But uh, there's a great book, um, Hillbilly Nationalists, Urban Race Rebels and Black Power, Community Organizing in Radical Times, where they go into these very working class um, organizations who maybe would have become part of the Rainbow Coalition, but the Rainbow Coalition, the assassination of Fred Hampton, uh, just in 1969, uh, 26 Panther leaders were targeted for execution by COINTELPRO. Um, so really a whole generation of leadership is taking out, taken out. So when we talk about white lightning in the Bronx, and we talk about these different community organizations, organic efforts, grassroots efforts to um, oppose addiction, understand addiction, work with addicts, politicize it, a lot of these efforts couldn't get full, they got off the ground, but they couldn't fully come to, uh, to fruition. So I thought this was an important image to start with. I'll be referencing uh, the pamphlet that inspired this talk, research, struggle. Um, and it was written by one of the Panther 21 here in New York, Michael Setawayo uh, Tabor. It's an incredible uh, pamphlet. It should be read in its entirety. Um, I mean, again, the Panthers, I think, uh, as Marxists, as Marxist Fanonis, as Leninist Fanonis, the Panthers really took Fanon and took these other uh, revolutionary intellectuals and, and ran with it. The Panthers had formulations like oppressed people specialize in killing one another in this formulation that we're looking at. And I think this is unfinished work and we need to pick up that, that revolutionary torch and keep, and keep running with it. So I do want to read, uh, well, first, this is more, uh, you know, when I'm teaching with my students and we go deep into PTSD or, or, or trauma, things, this is not your typical, maybe Marxist or intellectual talk, not to equate, you know, Marxism with just quote unquote intellectualism, but, you know, take, take time for yourself if, if I, because life has made me talk, I, I will throw out stuff that's impacted me and, 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 the, and the people I love the most in life, like sexual violence, like incest, like heroin and fentanyl and overdoses. Again, um, I didn't choose this topic. This topic chose me. And when I write on it, it just feels like I'm a messenger or, or a conveyor um, from, for the generational struggles through my, my family line. Um, Irish roots, Scottish roots, English working class roots. Finnish roots. I was born and raised in Brockton, Massachusetts, came out to the Bronx in um, 1996. And I, I learned every, every day more about this, this topic, um, what the Panthers called the plague. When you walk through the Bronx, when you walk through Brockton, this plague is more of a plague than ever. So we see that capitalism cannot, can clearly not solve these problems. So let's read a few of these um, passages. Um, is the writing big enough to have someone else uh, uh, read the first bullet point? Looks good. Okay. It's, it's complicated. Shall I read it? Shall I yes, read thank it? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Okay. The, the basic reason 
The basic reason why the plague cannot be stopped by the drug prevention and rehabilitation programs is that these programs, with their archaic, bourgeois, Freudian approach, and their unrealistic therapeutic communities, do not deal with the causes of the problem. These programs deliberately negate, or at best deal flippantly, with the socioeconomic origin of drug addiction. These programs sanctimoniously deny the fact that capitalist exploitation and racial oppression are the main contributing factors to drug addiction in regard to black people. These programs were never intended to cure black addicts. They can't even cure white addicts they were designed for. Next uh, reader. Oh, okay, I have to unmute people, <laughs> hold on. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. You want to take it from the audience? Yeah, just to make it more interactive, if that's okay. okay. Anyone can read it. Uh, you want me to read? Uh, yeah, uh, please, please. This fascist government defines the cause of addiction as the importation of the plague into the country by smugglers. They themselves even admit that stopping the in entry of the plague is impossible. For every kilo of heroin, they confiscate, at least 25 kilos get past customs agents. The government is well aware of the fact that even if they were able to stop the importation of heroin, dope dealers and addicts would simply find another drug to take its place. The government is totally incapable of addressing itself to the true causes of drug addiction, for to do so would necessitate affecting a radical transformation of this society. The social consciousness of this uh, society, the values, mores, and traditions would have to be altered. And this would be impossible without totally changing the way in which the means of producing social wealth is owned and distributed. Only a revolution can eliminate the plague. Thanks. Um, I can read the last one. Uh, drug addiction is a monstrous symptom of the malignancy which is ravaging the social fabric of this capitalist system. Drug addiction is a social phenomenon that grows organically from the social system. Every social phenomenon that emanates from a social system that is predicated upon and driven by bitter class antagonisms that result from class exploitation must be seen from a class point of view. So from a very early age, and my mother deserves all of the credit as well as the different revolutionary organizations who gave me training, sent me to Cuba when I was 16 years old. Um, I, I got deep into seeing in, in my family, um, in my community, the social realities, but I was a bit precocious because I had the Panthers and I had Malcolm and I had Bobby Sands and, 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 and the, the revolutionaries that came out of the IRA um, to fill in some of the blanks. And when you're reading George Jackson in seventh, eighth grade, certainly my peers and basketball teammates didn't quite understand <laughs> what I was reading, um, but it gave me early insights to what was uh, afflicting so many of us around me. So, uh, that kind of roots us um, into the contributions of the Panthers. Of course, the Panthers were uh, amazing because, okay, they're principally reflecting on the black experience in America, but they're really respect, uh, reflecting too on a, on a class reality as well that I think applies to poor whites, um, that applies to Puerto Ricans and Chicanos and other oppressed people. And of course, the Panthers really challenged this question of the historical role of the lumpen proletariat. Um, when I look at my own class origins, there's an interesting mix of petty bourgeois class origins, very working class, um, and also lumpen. I think uh, oftentimes it's more of a mix with our families than maybe some of us even uh, it, it admit. So the Panthers spoke directly to me. Um, and, and their slogans, this pamphlet ends by saying, seize the time, intensify the struggle, destroy the plague, all power to the people. I'll share uh, the link to all of this in the entire PowerPoint so people can revisit it on their, uh, on, at, at their own uh, leisure. Um, 
yeah, we really got to get into the generational aspects of, of this. Um, one thing I've noticed over time with the PTSD that we, we carry um, is not just the original acts, the original sins, whether it's the sexual violence or wh whatever happened within our families, but then there's a very, uh, there's an accompanying concomitant denial. Uh, especially in the Irish American context, you know, Catholics don't talk about this stuff. Um, so the denial and what I noticed is often when these things aren't aired out in a therapeutic way, in a family way, in, a, in an AA recovery, whatever the pathway is towards recovery, towards redemption, when the things aren't aired out, the pain is just buried deeper and deeper and deeper. So I don't think we can understand addiction at the family on macro level without getting into these ideas of, of denial, of capitalist mythology, of American dreaming, um, bootstrap uh, uh, ideology, and, 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 and all of these uh, this capitalist ethos. So um, this is uh, a, a book that I put out um, where I go deep into my, my own writing as it evolved uh, on this, this topic. My son blazes within me, so many contradictions, so little time. That was the 2006 transit strike. And that's my son Ernesto, uh, two years of age, but uh, in solidarity with the MTA's uh, strike. So I had all these journal entries from over the years uh, in, in, in poetry. Uh, I'm a student of some of these legendary, uh, you know, working class poets. Um, and again, like I said, I really didn't write this book. It, it wrote me in a sense, um, all my reflections over the years. Um, I got a call, this, is, this, this was or is my cousin, uh, Ben. He was uh, a cousin that I didn't really grow up with. Um, that part of the family too is like super Q, uh, uh, QAnon conspiracy theorist trumped out, but that's a little too much information. But he overdosed uh, a few years back and I just got the phone call and next thing you know, I'm driving up um, Route 95 to Route 90 to, uh, to Fitchburg, uh, Massachusetts, to that area. And um, all these overdoses in the family just had me kind of like the Michael McDonald uh, story, All Souls, a good book, probably lacking some of the historic Marxist context that we would, we would use, but a, a good book nonetheless. And when I read that book, All Souls, and when I go to these funerals and wakes, it, it weighs on you, you know? The trauma, you, you feel it, you carry it. You know, somebody asked me in an interview recently, you have a chip on your shoulder. And I said, fuck a chip on my shoulder. I have centuries and centuries of working class resentment and working class chauvinism um, on, my, on my shoulders. Working class chauvinism is a concept that I learned about from a, 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 an Italian American writer, Alfred Lebrano. He wrote a book called um, Limbo, and it's about working class students who somehow sneak into Ivy League institutions and the cultural uh, difficulties when, when you come from a different background and suddenly you're at a, a Stanford or a Brown or whatever, um, the cultural conflicts and how that manifests. So working class chauvinism, I throw out that concept because uh, reflection of everything we've had to overcome, to quote Bertolt Brett, our very survival is, is a miracle. So I plotted out this family tree. And when I plotted out the family tree on my mother's side, on my father's side, it was just the same thing. It was PTSD, it was generational trauma, it was overdoses. And I started to put together more and more what this meant in a, in a bigger sense. And then that took me into this other um, area of study, which this talk is not about, but I can't give this talk without going into this. So this is the article of another piece that I wrote because the, the sexual violence was, was everywhere and it was generational. I remember my sister saying, and like my sister is really the true I keep saying I'm not gonna put people's stories out there, but it's almost impossible not, not to do. But, um, you know, like my siblings are the, and my mom, uh, they're the true, they're the true heroes. And they might not, never written a word in their lives about this stuff, but they're the true survivors. Um, I have my own, you know, PTSD and stuff. But again, I, if my PTSD was, was deeper, I don't think I'd be giving this talk. 
You know what I mean? So it's, it's, it's that being one step removed from the trauma that allowed me to often reflect upon it. Angela Davis talks about the personal is political. And, and, and so this is coming from a very historical place, but also from a very personal place. Um, so to live among broken men, theorizing rape and incest was another piece that um, has, has, has written me in, in life. And I'm glad I could put it together um, thanks to different intellectual uh, mentors and, and you know, it took me decades really to write that that piece, but you can find it at, uh, it's a working class think tank, leftist think tank, uh, Hampton, the Hampton Institute. Yeah, this would, this, you all don't need these slides. This stuff is Marxism 101 for you all, but I do want to quote, uh, Paolo Freire has this formulation um, that I adapted to the context of the US. Um, so many of our young people, we learn, we see someone uh, homeless on the street um, and we say, that's a bum. We see someone strung out on third Ave and we say, that's a tecato, that's a, that's a junkie. And th those words dehumanize us and they dehumanize our sisters and brothers uh, in, in the struggle. Um, I want to also reference uh, Gabor Mate. Gabor Mate, from a psychological point of view, a social work point of view, he's been there uh, in Vancouver, the east side of Vancouver, at ground zero of the plague that, that impacts, I think, every capitalist country, but in this case, Canada. And Gabor Mate says, we readily feel for the suffering child, but cannot see the child in the adult who his soul fragmented and isolated hustles for survival a few blocks away from where we shop or work. So capitalism as a myth-making machine intentionally um, through the superstructure of this society further internalizes all of the pain in generational trauma because it blames us. And it teaches us to, uh, to blame. I'm, I'm, I'm in all these different recovery groups and stuff and I've known people for three, four, nine years, whatever it is. And I'm just so amazed when 10 years into the journey, they're still pointing the finger at a sister and saying, I just don't understand why she can't put that pipe down. So the judgmentalness, you know, and in recovery, we say, um, if I'm not working on myself, I'm working on somebody else. And I have to keep up, I have to clean up my own side of the street. So this talk also comes out of recovery in the work that I've had to do on, on, on myself because we know the role of COINTELPRO, of course, 100%. They were expert at exacerbating the, inter the internalized and internal contradictions of the Panthers. Um, but those contradictions were there, whether it was the machismo or, 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 or the propensity. I mean, how did Huey, Huey the, the, the system killed Huey P. Newton, but he ended up dying basically in, in, in a gutter of, 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 of Oakland. Um, the CIA, the FBI played their role, but there were already existing contradictions due to the nature of this, of this society, right? So how do we build working class organizations when we're all construed of these deep seated contradictions? that manifest in all these different ways, addiction, addiction being, being one of them. So how do we overcome all of that internalized backwardness and, and biases? Um, here are the numbers, the official numbers. Of course, these tallies by the CDC, uh, the Center for Disease Control are low. How many people have died in the streets and it was never attributed to heroin or, or, or fentanyl, but I'll just draw our attention to the, the latest study. Uh, in the period ending in May 2020, there were 81,000 drug overdoses in that 12 month period from May 2019 to the next year. And with this pandemic raging uh, in our recovery groups and our 12 step groups, you know, we immediately went to online. Um, but addicts need that, you need that circle. Um, recovery is irreplaceable in our lives. And suddenly, we're on Zoom and we're sharing anonymously on, on in, in Zoom and it, and it wasn't the same. So we've seen a spike in, in addiction, um, certainly since, since the pandemic raged and the CDC backs up that, that conclusion with the numbers, with the cold numbers. Again, this is Marxism 101. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time here, 
but all these myths about human nature that we're all greedy by um, this is my, my undergrad experience um, <clears throat> during graduation you know we thought that Herodotus Sophocles and Plato etc did not <laughs> capture the full breadth of humanities of human thought so we added some names to the likes of Anzaldua and Chang and, and, and Hurston and Morrison to try to balance out that curriculum. But it's important to keep coming back to the ruling ideas in every epic are the ideas of the ruling class. So as we try to heal, and these contradictions come up in our recovery groups, because we're not just trying to overcome the individual addiction, we're trying to overcome the wider family context, the generational trauma, the denial that we might not be, be aware about. And so many of us don't realize we're also trying to overcome an entire societal superstructure in, in, in infrastructure. And this was interesting for me being such a politicized human being from a young age. Um, you know, they first, the movement first sent me to Cuba. I was 16 years old learning Spanish in Cuba. I incredible, you know, kind of jumpstart on, on class thinking. Um, in recovery, Tradition number 10, right? The steps prevent us from killing ourselves and the traditions present us from killing one another. Tradition number 10 will never bring religious disputes or political views into recovery, um, which, is, which is interesting and necessary, is very necessary. If we all started giving opinions in a recovery group, whether it was in New York or California, and we talked about Iran or Turkey, of course we'd be very divided, but at the same time, and this is what the Panthers were saying. And that's what this book asks, Hillbilly Nationalists, Urban Race Rebels and Black Power. Can we truly heal just on an individual level? And if we don't have the community healing, if we don't have the national healing from national oppression, like the black community goes through, if we don't have healing from the misogyny and the white supremacy, can there truly be any, any healing? These are the big questions that the Panthers asked. Um, scientifically, uh, when we're talking about addiction, uh, in, in so many of the cases, in so many of the studies that I've read, it, the numbers are astronomical. And my article goes into this. Um, I don't know, it's almost like you can't read one article without the, the other, but the one article on sexual violence, the other article on addiction, can't understand one without understanding the other. But most studies say anywhere from 60 to 80% of hardcore addicts. So when we talk about hardcore addicts, you know, we're talking about alcohol more than just a week or hard drugs. Um, they've been through some type of PTSD and often sexual violence. So these images try to capture that. And there's entire books that lay out a scientific understanding, the hijacking of the, the brain um, when we get into trauma and addiction. And Matulu Shakur, and his work with the Lincoln Detox Center here in the South Bronx. And there's a reason why he's still locked in a cage uh, underground in a maximum federal security prison in Arizona because of what they were, the ruling class is still afraid of them. Um, how many years later that the Panthers haven't even, even existed, right? Um, a great book by a scholar who goes into this very reality, the body keeps the score. We carry all of this in our resentments and our anger and our body language. Um, I get into more of the brain being hijacked and how systematic these, these things are. So yeah, um, good quote here by Gabor Mate. Uh, I'm more or less at the halfway point, a little over the halfway point of my presentation if we have time. I actually wanna put a two minute clip of Gabor Mate. I think his work is groundbreaking and inspiring. Um, his son is at the gray zone. His son, Aaron Mate is also uh, amazing. Um, the greatest damage done by neglect, trauma, or emotional loss is not the immediate pain they inflict, but the long-term distortions they induce in the way a developing child will continue to interpret the world and her situation in it. All too often these ill-conditioned implicit beliefs become self-fulfilling prophecies in our lives. We create meanings from our unconscious interpretation of early events, and then we forge our present experiences from the meaning we've created. Unwittingly, we write the story of our future from narratives based on the past. 
mindful awareness can bring into consciousness those hidden past-based perspectives so that they are no longer, no longer frame our worldview. Choice begins the moment you disidentify from the mind and its conditioned patterns, the moment you begin become present. Until you reach that point, you are unconscious. In present awareness, we are liberated from the past. So in the realm of hungry ghosts, speaks to that need to escape. As we say in recovery, the only way uh, out of it is, is through it. Can't run from some of these things. How do we make peace with it? And now I think you see why I, I had to put the, the trigger warning, because this for all of us brings up so many, so many things. Hence the name of that book, right? In the realm of hungry ghosts. Sometimes we're so busy surviving, we're so busy fleeing and escaping, how do we actually sit with it? So I've also discovered a fair amount of uh, uh, Buddhism uh, over the years and in different types of spirituality to deal with this type of type of things because sleeping at night can be can become impossible when you carry a lot of this stuff. Uh, another great book, How Inherited Family Trauma Shapes Who We Are and How to End the Cycle. It didn't start with you. And in my own journey too, um, I think some of these books are great. They don't have the overarching worldview, political worldview, perhaps the, the Marxist worldview that we would like to infuse, but I think that's our role as, as organizers, as organic uh, intellectuals. Um, my story, if I didn't stop the political side, because we can, being a workaholic can be a good thing, but being a workaholic can be another escape. And George J Jackson talked about how he, were, he was an ox for the people to ride towards, towards freedom in the role of Jonathan Jackson, the 17 year old brother who, who died in the, in the class struggle and the black liberation struggle. For me in my journey, I, I, needed, I needed a complete stop from the political so that I could look within and, and heal some of my own demons. Because if you're worried about Haiti and Ecuador and tomorrow there's elections and not tomorrow, literally, but figuratively in El Salvador and Honduras later this year and Brazil next year, forget about it. You're so, you're so in the struggle, you can't clean up your own side of the street. So I owe that to recovery. It taught me to be more present because your phone's going off for Syria, your phone's going off for Palestine. How can you sit and be? So that's part of my own, own journey. And I was in my, uh, a men's group this morning and I'm, you know, I just, I, I just give thanks I'm just grateful for the whole journey. That's another trick we learn um, when we're, you know, dwelling in the PTSD or the self-pity. That's a fine line sometimes. The pity them, how do we, you know, what, what does the program teach us? It teaches us to reach out to another fellow and to be of service, not to get trapped in, in the pain. Um, another book by Gabor Mate, When the Body Says No, uh, really getting into the effects of, of addiction uh, on the brain. The heart has a brain. I thought that was a deep quote. Um, ah, this gets into <clears throat> so much of uh, what this system does to our children. It's so outdated. I'll come back and then you can read the slide ever. But this whole thing of special education, I know that's outdated terminology now, but that was certainly the terminology for for decades, special education, it was special oppression. Who was in the special education classes 90% of the time? The most oppressed kids, the black, Latino children, the poor children. So a lot of times, so much of this stuff gets thrown under the rug. People don't wanna talk about the generational trauma, the systematic oppression. So who gets labeled? The children get labeled. The children get labor, labeled, um, whether it's crack baby or hyperactive, all these different things. And I'm not saying scientifically that that's not real, but until we cure the overall overarching context, how can there be any true healing? You know, and that, that quote by Malcolm X is, is everything. Um, a chicken cannot lay a duck egg. This system cannot produce uh, freedom for our people. And I, you know, I'm clearly I'm, I'm not into this whole identity politics thing. I think I talk about that in the Max Blumenthal interview, if you all saw it, but on paper, a 6'6 white dude 
retired boxer. That was the only problem. I told Roger that the biography is a little off because I'm not uh, I'm not fighting now. I'm not an active. I'm a retired fighter. I fought. I was a boxer. But <laughs> if you put me in Madison Square Garden now, it wouldn't be pretty. I just had hip replacement surgery from uh, all those fights. I mean, boxing was a great escape, but uh, it takes it. So I'm 42 years old. I could barely walk. I couldn't walk for two years until they rebuilt my hip. So a lot of glory in your 20s, a lot of reflection in your 30s, and a lot of surgeries in your, your 40s. But let's keep it moving. <laughs> um, so, yeah, we don't want to label our, our children. Um, another book by Gabor Mate. I must really be, be a fan and student, huh? Scattered How Attention Deficit Disorder Originates and What We Can Do About It. So he himself, his family, they were survivors of the Holocaust in Hungary. And he talks about, he directly links his hyper uh, hyperactivity, what he was struggling with, the name of that book, Scattered, uh, he, he, he relates it back to his childhood uh, trauma. So highly recommend all of those, those books. Um, next slide here, we have, um, yeah, so to get into the research of Dr. Joy, uh, DeGru, incredible research, post-traumatic slave syndrome. Um, yeah, this idea of the emancipa Emancipation Proclamation and again, all the myth-making about Lincoln as if Lincoln, as if one white man could ever free anybody else. I mean, of course, enslaved people uh, freed themselves and with a pivotal factor, W.B. Du Bois research and black reconstruction, um, important, important research. But at what point in American history did the trauma, whether it's the racial trauma, the national oppression, the trauma inflicted upon working people, when did it ever end? And it, it's, it's ongoing. Look at the prison system today. Um, look at the systematic segregation. Um, no reparations were ever uh, 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 granted. You know, it's still a, an incredible, uh, an incredible demand of, of our struggles. Um, in the next slide, getting towards the end of the, the PowerPoint, but of course my duty, um, Trotsky has an amazing uh, passage. It was the turn of the uh, 18th century into the 19th, uh, 19th century into the 20th century. And he talked about the duty, no matter how difficult things were, um, that we would never uh, give in to the to ruling class ideology and we would never give in to these myths about human nature and that we would always um hold fast to the to revolutionary optimism that we can build a new world and i know i i mentioned trotsky's name i mean i'm a student of trotsky i'm a student of stalin i'm a student of lenin i'm a student of bukharin i'm not trying to get into a trotsky eyed stalinite oh he mentioned trotsky oh my god that stuff to me is very divisive uh, we should see things dialectically. Um, and I think Trotsky was one of those dialecticians uh, historically. I don't see how you could be a student of the Russian Revolution without reading his, his work. But that doesn't make me one of these. Um, I, I, Trotsky wasn't a Trotskyist. So I think some of those labels often divide us um, more than they should. But I couldn't end this talk without talking about the example of Cuba, the Boulevardians. Um, even communal experiences. And that's what Engels did a lot of his research on, on, on the family, um, the family private property and capitalism. I got the title wrong, but uh, you, know, you know the exact book that I'm, I'm referencing. And he did the anthropological research and he looked at different communal societies, what they called primitive communism. Um, so there's so much hope in terms of how we can organize human society. And this social organization known as capitalism is, is, not, um, is not possible of solving our problems, whether it's in Haiti or Nicaragua or, well, Nicaragua is on the offensive against capitalism or Central America or, or anywhere. We need a new human social formation, a new organization. So every time I've been to Cuba, despite this blockade, we've seen the Cubans challenge. I'm not going to go as far. I'm not an idealist. I'm not going to say the Cubans have overcome heterosexism or homophobia or machismo. That's ridiculous. 
And in Cuba, the special period never ended. And Venezuela is living through a special period. Um, so, and, and, and that's really the function of these blockades, these airtight blockades that are economic blockades, their media blockades, their diplomatic blockades, the military blockades, they're all encompassing. And they're designed to stunt and stultify the efforts of a liberated people who are in a process of liberation. To say Venezuela is socialist is, is, is not accurate. One could say Cuba is a dictatorship of the proletariat, but the blockade is there to make sure they can't continue to heal at the macro societal level and even on the individual level. So if we were to do different um, anthropological ethnographic studies, which I've done in kind of an amateurish type way of alcoholism in Cuba, I guarantee you that post-1991, alcoholism begins to, to go up again more because it's, it's a people who are suffocated um, um, Briado, starved on all sides by this blockade, yet they continue to fight. So all of humanity uh, owes the Cuban people and, and the Bolivarian masses. Um, you know, Iran is not a socialist system, but the Iranian people withstand um, war every day. Atilio Borron, the Argentinian um, revolutionary sociologist talks about um, how the blockade on Venezuela is the equivalent of silent atomic bombs that have gone off. Uh, just in 2018, um, 40,000 Venezuelans, and that's a conservative estimate, lost their lives because uh, as the direct result of the blockade, not being able to get the food they would be able to get if the system was allowed to, to the Bolivarian system, which has all types of defects and is some type of halfway house. Um, between capitalism and, and socialism. But this slide is of course important to say that we recognize the efforts of different socialist countries or halfway houses between socialism and, and capitalism in their efforts. So this, this uh, image of Cuban school children and to go to Cuba and, and to see what Ernesto Che Guevara talked about, how capitalism had converted all of society into a gigantic school of greed and capitalism and individualism and consumerism. Well, in Cuba, what have they done? They've converted society into a giant school of socialism. And instead of seeing McDonald's um, billboards and Heineken and here in the Bronx, they had this horrific series of hepatitis C uh, billboards everywhere. Um, in Cuba, you see billboards of Black liberation from uh, uh, Oakland to Angola. So to reset, to rebuild the superstructure of, of society and all the hope that those who resist in the global South, in the periphery, in the exploited countries, because they're not just trying to overcome the present day blockade, they're trying to come overcome centuries and centuries of, of exploitation. So the way they deal with um, all of these questions uh, in Cuba, and I'll, I'll, I'll end on that note. Um, we're at more or less 42, 43 minutes. I'm gonna start really winding down. Um, but Malcolm X, education is the passport towards the future. Tomorrow belongs to those who pre prepare for it today. So um, we all should be in anti-imperialist and revolutionary organizations. We be, should be a part of book clubs, to quote Bobby Sands, or to paraphrase Bobby Sands, um, Republican or otherwise. When I say Republican, I'm talking about Irish Republicans, of course, fighting for one united Irish Republic. Um, Republican or otherwise, revolutionary or otherwise. We all have a role to play. And that's what the Panthers were talking about. When you're on the offensive, when you're fighting a system, can I identify when you bring the ghosts the hungry ghosts into the realm of consciousness when you're on the front lines and you're doing service service in the sense of of the aa na uh, all fellowship service of individual one-on-one -on -one picking up the phone telephone therapy as we say but also service to serve the people to use the chinese uh, the, the revolutionary slogan from the, the Chinese revolution in 1949, to serve the people. Uh, the Filipinos today in, in, their, in their class war. And when you're serving the people and you're also serving at the individual level and at the revolutionary level, 
that's where the true individual healing is. That's where the true collective healing, societal healing is. And I think that Cuba, I'll share um, one or two anecdotes. Um, the proliferation of, of culture in Cuba, um, all these incredible opportunities uh, for people to find their African roots and to find their Caribbean roots. I was a part of different poetry groups and hip hop groups in, in Cuba. That's part of the healing to identify these different things. And um, I don't know if the research has, has been done, but you can look at pre-revolutionary, um, pre-1959, a look at alcoholism, which is probably the preferred drug in many, you know, Latino countries, even though like in Dominican culture, I lived in the Dominican Republic for years. And if you, if you smell marijuana, everyone's talking about there's an addict here, ta fumando marijuana, because that, that, that colonial Catholicism, marijuana is like the most stigmatized thing. Meanwhile, you got nine people falling down drunk, dizzy from, from, from rum, and no one even notices because that's Dominican culture, right? So I tried to publish an article in the Dominican Republic, a tribute to Bob Marley, and they couldn't publish it because everyone thought Bob Marley was a junkie. So you can see how these stigmas and the things that we've internalized. Um, one anecdote from Cuba, there was a kid who was running around and he was about six or seven, super cute, creative kid. And in the American context, everyone would say, oh, he's hyperactive, give him a bunch of, of drugs. Because that's one of the main ways that we get addicted, right? It, the legalized drugs. I mean, that's the, the number one way that people get uh, overdose on heroin because they get the oxycodones and the next thing you know, they're addicted to that and they're in the streets looking for a cheaper version and they need, need more. We know how opioids um, operate. Um, and I was looking at the parents and some of the cultural workers, we were in this community event and I was like, I, I just wanna, compliment you all because you're treating this young man with all the love and understanding and you're recognizing that his personality is a unique human personality like all of us and he likes to run around and he's a little bit of a roughhouser and he's rambunctious right but that doesn't mean that he needs Ritalin and, and all these addictive medications so I, I think the Cubans um are an incredible example for us to 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 follow so before we hit uh 50 minutes those are my initial uh, reflections. I think this is an important um, topic. Um, I hope that we can penetrate the superstructure of this, this sick capitalist society and have more of these um, big conversations. Sometimes I'll get these invitations to auditoriums and I'll speak to 500 kids in Brooklyn or the Bronx. Well, not now because we're in the pandemic times, but in the teachers or the assistant principals and the bureaucrats, they love me as long as it's like, oh, he overcame addiction and blah, blah, blah. He's a good guy. But as soon as I say, don't join the military and the NYPD is part of the problem, I never get invited back, you know, <laughs> seriously. So we have to we have to fight back at the individual and the collective level. Thank you, Thank you very much, Danny. That was a incredible presentation. Um, before we open this up to questions and answers and open discussion, um, I'd like to see if Jean, would you like to um, tell us a little bit about the next programs that we could be looking forward to? Jean? Okay. I, yes. Okay. I, I just unmuted myself. And thank you. Wow. That was really great, uh, Danny. Really appreciate what you said. And we have a lot to think about and talk about. Um, as we will next week as well. Next week, we're going to have our comrade Yusuf will give us a talk on, um, let's see here. It's going to be the it's, history of the communists and left movements in Turkey. Right, history of communists and left movements in Turkey. Our comrade Yusuf is with us. Uh, he's born in Turkey a member of both the Turkish Communist Party and Co U.S. Communist Party. And um, does Yusuf want to say a couple words on that? Or I, I think he's listening, but he um, is on the train and it's a little hard for him to okay. communicate. Okay, and the other one uh, is another one that you set up, uh, Roger. Oh, oh, it, uh, oh. oh Yusuf is on. Uh, okay. Yusef, do you want to comment any? Uh, yes, I, I, I will. Uh, uh, 
I think you're breaking up, Yusef, so um, it's, it's not work, working right. But um, we, we'll, we'll be looking forward to that program to, um, next um, a week from today on um, the left movements in Turkey and the, the meeting in the international context. And then the following Sunday, Rick Sterling is going to return. He's with the uh, Task Force on the Americas, the Mount Diablo Peace Center, um, the Syria Solidarity Movement, um, and the um, Veterans Against the War. And he'll be talking about a topic that he's been doing a lot of investigative reporting on. And this is the anti-doping charges and the and the um, international context of anti-doping as part of a political offensive against the Chinese and Russians by the Western press. And he's going to talk about two particular cases of people that were involved in these anti-doping um, charges and go into the international politics behind that. So I hope you'll join us then. Um, also, um, Moving on to the next sort of segment, you, um, we usually make a fun uh, appeal right now. Uh, Richard Fallenbaum, our treasurer, said, asked me if I could just do it quickly. He will put the information in the chat of how you can um, uh, send money to the to us, and we ask you to make voluntary donations to support the work of the, of the Institute for the Critical Study of Society. And we also share some of that money with the Neville Proctor Marxist Library to keep that institution going and alive. And with that, uh, I see that um, Richard has put that into the um, chat. So thank you, Richard. And with that, I'd like to open it up to Q&A. So if you can either raise your hand electronically or raise your hand on um, the screen, and I'll try to call on um, people. We, we ask you to try to make um, either a statement or a question or, or both, and to, and to try to limit it to about two minutes. And um, if um, you go over, we'll stop you. So um, let's let's see if there's any Q&A questions. Um, do, do, do I see any hands up there? Um, uh, not, not, I don't see any hands right now. So I'll, I'll, I'll kick that off. And, and Danny, thank you for that incredible wide ranging presentation. Um, it kind of reminds me of way back in the late 60s when I was doing community organizing in Spanish Harlem. And you, you, you might know the geography there, but if you go way to the east side of Spanish Harlem, you abut with what was, was then called Little Italy. And right on the boundary line, there was this uh, uh, playground area that was lit up at night. And one side was the housing authority police. And in this playground, it was like a flea market at night, but it was a flea market for heroin. There was just heroin being sold openly. Anybody who wanted to get heroin, they could get it right there, right next to the housing authority police station. And that, that suggested that for all the talk that you heard in New York City about cleaning up the, 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 the drug stuff, that there was a collusion that was way up high, allowing that particular facility to, um, to thrive. And um, because it could easily, I mean, everybody knew about it. It was openly, it was illuminated at night. Um, yet the city authorities and did not close it down. And so I've always wondered what, what was the collusion between the actual government and the actual trading of narcotics on the street? Do you have any insights into that? Is it, uh, is it better if uh, we take five or six comments then I respond to all of them? Or how do you all want to do it? Well, it, it? I think it'd be more interactive if you do one at a time. Yeah. Yeah, well, Gary, uh, Gary Blum, the, the San Jose Mercury reporter um, who mysteriously died uh, with, with two bullets in his, his head, what, 50, 10, 15 years ago? There's that movie that came out, The Messenger. But... Gary Blum um, um, 
investi a great investigative journalist that became his raison d'etre, his reason for being, and he exposed the collusion that does indeed um, exist. Um, whether the collusion is, you know, directly like the 1980s with the cocaine and the crack cocaine into South Central Los Angeles, and we have all the, you know, the eyewitness testimony that's come out, um, Freeway Ricky Ross, and there's a great documentary about this called um, Bastards of the Party. I have a bunch of documentaries on this topic, but I think Bastards of the Party does an amazing job um, looking at the true social history of quote unquote gangs and how they started off as social organizations and street organizations. So there's no doubt there's collusion. And I, I think it's more about is the collusion direct or indirect? And even if the, um, the DEA is just letting, yeah, cause that's the question, right? They can build a whole wall um, and, and, and they can be so concerned about human beings crossing uh, but but how how do so much drugs get into the most oppressed communities? So there has to be collusion because to quote New Jack City and Nino Brown, played by Wesley Snipes, um, ain't no Uzis made here in Harlem. We don't own um, the factories to make this stuff. So no question. Um, uh, that movie American Gangster with Denzel Washington, you know, traces that they would even hide the drugs uh, coming back um, in the coffins of the of the soldiers. Uh, I'm not saying that was a common thing, but uh, if you trace, you know, um, if the U.S. Is, has been mired in this war of occupation of Afghanistan now for 20 years, uh, where, where, where's the dope coming from? Um, what's the relationship between the U.S. government and the Mexican government? I mean, AMLO, Lopez Obrador certainly has, has neutralized that some, but how is that, how is Mexico the new Colombia and what role has the U.S. played? So no doubt there's, there's collusion. Thank you. Um, next up is Gene, followed by Richard W. Gene, please. And please add me to the list, Roger. Oh, okay, and Raj. Okay, I'm unmuted. You know, well, thank you very much. Very, very interesting. And I come at the whole question <clears throat> from a different perspective because I've been an uh, academic uh, most of my life and uh, had a rather comfortable life. And right now I have a very comfortable retirement and I have to say it's a definite transformation. <clears throat> yeah, you, I understand that in Berkeley, they used to have a group called the Veterans of Future Wars. And their slogan was pensions now, fight later, which I think is a very good slogan. But um, again, I, I come at this first thing I did when I went to graduate school was join New Haven Corps, New Haven Corps, and then also at the Yale Socialist Club. So I've always seen these things linked together and I really appreciate the way that you've done it. But I wonder if you have any comments on one of your fellow um, Bronx people, uh, AOC, who recently had a very emotional uh, experience and reported on that in her traumatic background. I wonder if you have any comments on that. Yeah, I mean, what stood out to me the most about her bravery um, was how uh, horrifically um, mean, there's no other word for it, bullying mean the right-wing press was to say that she was a liar and to try to invalidate, regardless of her political ideology, uh, can anyone on the left or the right or even the, the fascist, proto, proto fascist, wannabe fascist, to use that term scientifically, can anyone deny that sexual violence uh, is, is, is intrinsic to this society against women, against children? Um, so I would express nothing but solidarity, you know, towards her for her being valiant, um, you know, of course, politically, there's a lot of contradictions with her um, within uh, DSA. I don't even know if it's clear if she's a member of DSA. That's another conversation. But I think she speaks for millions and millions of, of, of Latino women, of women in general. Um, in some of my writing, I talk about because, of course, the sexual violence against women is endemic, but so many children too. Um, by the time I was 
14 years old, I had three basketball coaches who were child molesters, who were completely inappropriate with children. So again, that's part of the journey too. That's why I wrote, I wrote the other article, Theorizing Rape and Incest. Um, so as she comes out, I think it can uh, inspire others to do that, that work because um, when we let it fester, so I hope it's a, a healing moment for her. Um, and politics are very dynamic and politics are very dialectical. We can critique her for, for being a social Democrat or liberal or whatever. But of course, with this issue, um, we would want to express full, full solidarity. Thank you, Danny. Next, next up is Richard W. followed by Raj and then followed by Susan. So Richard, please. Yeah, Danny. Um, I uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, I, I, I sort of identified with something you said during it. Uh, I, I grew up in Maine um, uh, and and my, uh, uh, my, my parents were of uh, uh, Massachusetts uh, heritage, if you will. Um, <laughs> I, I, I've, I've, every time I would come down and, 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 and in the Boston area, I, I really felt very, very different that the, the social milieu uh, in the Boston area was very different from that, from that up in Maine. I, I was very much working class. Uh, I don't even call it where it was more agrarian, actually, but uh, consciousness. And, and they were very much more sophisticated. In any case, um, the question I had was this is that if I understood your presentation correctly, um, that, there are, that there are different pathologies uh, of, uh, of, uh, that present themselves from, from, different, from the different classes, i.e. The, 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 anyways, is that, is, is that, would that be true or could you address that? Thank you. Yeah, if, if I understood uh, correctly, um, I mean, an issue like addiction is not, uh, only within, um, you know, the, the working class or the oppressed classes, the toiling classes. Shoot, somebody could be from the. In, in fact, I work as a. I work as um. That that's one crazy thing about my journey. Somehow, coming out of twelve steps, it netted me a job because Lord knows, as a, <laughs> I've never got tenure or full time status as a professor, so <laughs> that pays a miserable, miserable pittance. But I got a job as a sober companion, a sober coach, and honestly, the most of the families I work with uh, are, are are billionaires, and I'm not using billionaires in figurative terms. Uh, these are real billionaire families, and they um, come from extreme wealth and privilege, but they're not somehow immune to to these very real life problems that are generated by this system. Um, so I think it is a class question. I think we do have to have a class analysis, but there's no way we can conclude that just because you're from a privileged class or an owning class that you won't be affected by uh, misogyny and violence against women. Um, I think from a class point of view, we have to go throughout history and look at prior to colonialism, how did indigenous societies, African societies, the Irish, um, you know, the 800 year Irish liberation struggle. It, here in uh, New York, they had uh, every Tuesday night before the pandemic, they had Irish language classes because that was part of the Irish liberation struggle to recover Gaelic or Irish. And I remember, not that I, I, I didn't <laughs> learn much Irish beyond Chucky e. Arla, Ireland will be free. But uh, I remember them saying that in the Irish language, there was no possessive words. You couldn't say my house or our house because the house belonged to everybody in the communal sense. So I think we have to return to that uh, class analysis and, and we can keep learning from the different historical experiments, anthropologically, ethnographically. And that's why for me, it's been amazing, poor white kid from Brockton, Massachusetts, right? Who on paper, you, I don't fit the definition of, of poor or oppressed or anything, um, white, male, identified not as LGBTQ, but as heterosexual. I'm 6'6", six, six. I was an athlete, blah, 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 blah. But what does that say about my class experience? It says nothing. So we see how 
um, identity politics falls so far short of um, answering these big questions. Okay, thank thank you, Danny. Um, but Roger's up next, and next, and then, and then next in that order would be Susan, Richard Johnson, Jackie DeSalvio, and then Sharon. So, Raj, please. Uh, thank you, Danny, for a, an excellent presentation. I think it's very much along the Marxist lines, in my opinion. Uh, the question of uh, uh, drug abuse or addiction to substance, substance addiction is very old uh, and predates capitalism as well. Uh, patriarchy, for example, predates capitalism, which sets the stage for oppression as an extremely oppressive male domination of both female and children. So that's one source. And then capitalism adds to it by the alienation and insecurity that it creates, spits people against each other. So that's another source as far as I can see. But I wanted to ask you, um, could you comment on my observation on that? And, and the other thing is, since you've studied the question, what is the scale of the problem and how has it grown, let's say in the last 30 years since, which is the most dramatic period of neoliberalism in the United States, mm. or, or maybe 40 years, but 30 years certainly uh, is the most uh, impactful. So if you could address those two points of mine. And thank you once again. Thank you, Raj. Um, and thank you, Ann, for Ann's comment here. Uh, when we prioritize oppressions and when we play oppression Olympics, who wins? Capitalism wins oppression Olympics. So that disunites us. And I was in, because um, a big part of this healing too is, is Al-Anon and understanding that our, our families, adult children of alcoholics and, and dysfunctional families, those meetings were very good because when like the code of the streets, uh, when you're growing up sometimes, it's like you want to be the toughest and my family has the most overdoses and we got the most in prison. And I went to Al-Anon one day and I just said, I don't, I don't want to be from the family with the most fentanyl overdoses. I'm leaving it all right here. This is not some street badge of honor. Um, so I wanted to leave this, yeah, the oppression Olympics and however that manifests. This whole thing takes me back to grad school or something uh, or, or many of the contemporary conversations. Who's more oppressed? I ask my students this sometimes to reframe it this way. I'll ask my students who are, I see some other professors from CUNY here too. So greetings to them. But uh, at CUNY, I, our students are 99% Black, Latino from very oppressed uh, backgrounds, at least at John Jay College and Hostess College and York College, where, where I've been the past 15 years. Um, and I asked the students, who do you have more in common with? Um, a rich Black person, a rich Dominican, or a poor white person? And they've never, they don't teach class analysis in this society, so they've never conceived of it that way. Another question I always ask my students, what percentage of your life, if you can break down your entire life, awake at least, because when you're sleeping, uh, is there oppression while we sleep too? Well, I'll leave that for some existentialist debate, but uh, philosophical class. But uh, I asked them, what percentage of your life has been living? What percentage of your life has been surviving? Because when you're surviving, you can't live and thrive. Turning to uh, Raj's uh, questions, I mean, that's the Engels book on the family and private property. He goes back anthropologically and looks at these different societies. I agree with you 100%. I probably misspoke in terms of feudalism, introducing patriarchy. There were also matriarchal societies that were pre-feudal and during feudalism. I'm certainly no anthropological expert on some of these questions. I'm trying to figure it out uh, as I go. Um, yeah, there was an interesting study in 2016. People were trying to make sense of the Trump phenomenon. And I think we're still trying to make sense of that because it's easy to get rid of Trump. How do you get rid of centuries of white supremacy and backwardness and American exceptionalism and American dreaming? American exceptionalism, which is nothing more than American, you know, arrogance and, and really um, it's ahistorical to put America up on a pedestal like Walter Rodney asked every time you walk down Fifth Avenue and Park Avenue and you see these skyscrapers and you see this infrastructure, how many 
African peasants, how much cacao and coffee had to be exploited in order to build up this infrastructure, infrastructure in the imperial center. Um, there was a study on the oxy electorate. I don't know if you all remember it from four years ago, but it was the counties in Ohio and Pennsylvania, this Rust Belt reality, poor whites who had voted in the highest numbers for Trump because Trump was their, their white knight, their savior, right? Um, that's how it was pitched to them. So I, I agree with you, Raj, that in these deindustrialized, super oppressed places, we're very clear white supremacy, white privilege is everywhere. It, it pervades this society. Um, and we're not trying to play oppression Olympics. It's not a competition. We know about national oppression and all these things. But poor whites, the poor whites have a voice. Trump, someone who's worth $4.5 billion was somehow the voice of poor whites. And poor whites, I know poor whites all too well. It's where I come from. Poor whites were ready to, as we saw, they were ready to have a coup, an insurrection, a failed coup, whatever you want to call it. They were ready to die and kill. Um, so there were so many contradictions there. So definitely, and that's the argument Bastards of the Party makes. There's also Black and Gold, an incredible documentary on the Latin kings and queens, which became the almighty Latin king and queen nation as they fought against their own sexism and incorporated the queens. So I think we do have to look at deindustrialization. We do have to look at all these economic factors. Um, you know, why was Eric Garner killed? Why was the brother in Baton Rouge killed? I think it was a year after um, Eric Garner. Um, why was Michael Brown killed? They weren't, they were killed because they were black, yes, but they weren't black millionaires. They were black people accused of, and beyond the accusations, none of us care. We're at an elevated level of thinking, but every white racist would say, well, Michael Brown stole uh, a cigar wrapper to smoke. Well, that meant, that meant he had to be shot in the back and murdered. Um, Eric Garner was selling $1 loose cigarettes. So of course, Raj, 100%, there's a huge economic context. And again, this system, the unemployment just gets worse and worse. The carceral system gets worse and worse. This system cannot solve our, our problems. Um, so Joe Biden can come with his $1,400 checks and that'll be popular and it should be popular and our people deserve that. There's nothing too good for the working class, but those are just band-aids. That's social democracy, liberalism at its finest. And to quote Malcolm, we don't want your crumbs. We want a bakery in which to make our own bread. So until there is economic self-determination, spiritual self-determination, all types of self-determination from Western Africa to Harlem, to these same oppressed communities that continue as oppressed as they were in the time of the Panthers, uh, in, in the time of, of Marcus Garvey in the largest black movement in the history of this country, the United Negro Improvement Association. So yeah, it's an ongoing struggle and, and, and neo, neoliberalism claims to be in the driver's seat, but uh, our resistance is, is, is everywhere. Um, and we have so, to keep- just, just to answer, just quickly, the, so the scale of the problem has increased since very dramatically. Do you have any idea of the scale, how much more it has gotten worse since 1990 or thereabouts? I don't know that I have those numbers. I can tell you that the latest numbers, the CDC has only been counting, I don't know if they've been counting overdoses to way back there then, but some of these censuses or polls or research is not scientific enough, but this is, this is what we're seeing. We're seeing increases. The pandemic is, is it's a twin pandemic. It's not just the coronavirus, but it's social isolation and it's, it's an economic recession, depression. So the numbers are going up compared to the 1970s, where I think there was a lot of proof too that the state itself, to go back to Roger's question, certainly the state um, wanted, the, they wanted to prey upon the Panther leadership's um, um, contradictions. We saw proof with that, with, with Huey P. Newton, psychological torture, physical torture. Um, they, they, they preyed upon the, the different internal contradictions. So um, I, I how do we not, we don't want to appear as conspiracy theorists, but how do we as scholars, as revolutionary scholars, 
how do we um, actually prove, put out the, the evidence, the empirical evidence and try to catch the US government red handed? Because even when they're caught red handed, it was the Kerry Commission in 1986, the Kerry Commission found that the US government all the way up the hierarchy was completely guilty. And then where's Oliver North today? And where is Ronald Reagan's the most, is what, isn't he supposedly the most popular president in the history of the US? So yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you. Next up is Susan, followed by Richard Johnson, followed by Jackie Salvio, and then finally Sharon has her hand up as well. So Susan, it's all yours. Hi, uh, thanks Danny for your presentation. I've always been interested in the connection between psychology and mental health and such issues and uh, politics. And I, um, your presentation made me think of a book from a long time ago called Surplus Powerlessness by Michael Lerner. Do you know of it? No, but I'm writing it down. Okay, he, he, was, he is a psychologist and he's since become a rabbi and um, he's here in the East Bay. Um, the book, obviously the title comes from, is a play on <clears throat> surplus plus value of Mark. And he, the book talks about, I don't remember it in detail, but what sticks with me is the fact that the economic system and racial and gender and all other oppressions um, leave people powerlessness. It's not always true. But um, I have found in my years of teaching at community college and also organizing in the community and the labor movement that lots of people feel very powerless. Um, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit about your experience working with people um, and, and um, trying to connect them with political movements and how that works and what works. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, great, great question. Um, how do we attract people to the movement? How do we solidify the relationship? How do we recruit to the movement? And then the real work, how do we train within the movement? Um, and I have some, some experience under my, my belt as do so many of you. We can go back and forth in the alphabet soup of the left in the US, but uh, I said this at the, the left forum probably. 12 years ago, but the alphabet soup, this group or that group, the true sign of a successful group, what group is recruiting the young, black, brown, white, multinational uh, youth, revolutionary youth and training them. I think every organization should be judged along, along those, those lines. Some groups are gonna die out and other groups are, are training the generation of, of militants and cadres for the, the future. Um, you know, what's been successful, it, it reminds me of that great book, uh, Communists in Harlem. You know, when a book's just so good, you have to buy two copies and you wanna buy a copy for everybody. Mark Nason's book, I think it was his early work and, and probably his most important book, but uh, that study of communists in Harlem in the, in the CPUSA in the 1930s, that was the heyday of the CPUSA when they had probably in the range of 100,000 cadre of militants across this country. I mean, I think that along with the Panthers and the Young Lords and the Rainbow Coalition, those were the high points of the American left when they were really on the verge of, of seizing power. Um, and what Mark Nason looks at uh, he's, he's at a Fordham University, which is about 10 minutes away from me, but uh, he looks at how in Harlem, those CPUSA members were the poets. They were the everyday people. They were the neighbors. They were, they were from the community. They were of the community. So I think we have to be the basketball coaches. We have to be the mentors. And within like recovery, I never stop. I never stop with my revolutionary point of worldview. I'm in an AA meeting and it's there. It's there. I'm focused on my recovery. I'm not gonna um, <laughs> infringe upon uh, tradition number 10, which I highlighted, but I feel people out over time. And if I think there's a fit, I, I'll always keep it, of course, professional in the realm of what we do in NA and AA and all that. But 
if there's potential to build with them and, 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 and there's like a hook, there's a, a relationship outside of that, no question, I'm going to say, check out this book. As, as a recruiter, I don't want to say I'm an ex-recruiter, but we play different roles as revolutionaries in our lives. And who I am at 42 is not who I went, was at 32. When I was fighting in Madison Square, I thought I was invincible. You couldn't sit me down and talk to me about a lot of this shit. I was ready to tear up you know, uh, uh, capitalism. And I thought I was invincible and we're not, you know, we're not invincible, but I try to build with, with everybody, um, that Bobby Sands quote, everyone has a role to replay, uh, to play, um, try to, I mean, social media is, is a huge front now of, of struggle and to get, get everybody into these different, uh, book reading clubs. Um, Every organization, I think, plays their, their role. Hopefully that begins to address your, your question. If I didn't quite address it, feel free to follow up. Okay, thank you. Uh, Richard Johnson. Richard, unmute yourself. I think, thank you, Richard. Hello. Okay, I'd like to introduce my wife, Kit. She's here. Hi, Danny. This is Kit. Um, I want to thank you very much for coming here to speak about this very uh, complex and difficult issues um, uh, that is the topic for today. Uh, you're a powerful speaker that raises issues that need to be raised, and we need more educators like you. Uh, the Me Too movement has put a spotlight on this issue as well, so we have a huge opportunity here um, to make more inroads into um, on the side, it looked good. It would be good to know how many women are here to participate in the discussion and in the ICSS. Um, but anyway, this is a difficult subject that encompasses complexities that take time to read and contemplate and fully hash out. Um, I think that, um, you know, we just don't have that time here, but we're glad that you've introduced uh, these uh, views. Uh, and your personal experience. I can talk about my personal experience, but it's too much to go through in a few minutes. Um, and uh, let's see. Yeah, and then thinking about my own family, what they've been to, through and uh, how, how it's left them. Um, um, and even thinking about, um, you know, my own harassment actually ended when I reached a certain age and cut my hair and became more vocal. So, uh, that's, I found that quite interesting how that happened. Um, the impact of U.S. imperialism through coloni colonizing uh, communities of color internationally is still felt, and it will take, you know, many generations of healing. Um, my community is from the Philippines, you know, a country that uh, is, has a matriarchal base and, uh, in its own history, but was colonized and devastated like many communities of color around the world uh, that uh, are indigenous. Um, but anyway, the, the, the generations that were impacted by World War II and, you know, the whole history of colonization and are dying off. And it's going to be the current generations, the younger generations, that are going to have to take up these discussions um, the uh, current generation, I think, is far more open to talking openly about sex and addiction than ever. And this this is in the U.S. Um, more education is needed, and this needs to, to start before college. Subjects that are considered taboo are wide open now. Um, and I know that in my own growing up generation, it was very embarrassing to talk about some of this stuff. So, um, That's uh, two minutes. Yeah. I, okay, sorry. I keep reading about the the denial, whether in social media or in the you know general general media. But anyway, and then the Catholic Church, of course, has has its own his feudal history steeped in denial and blame. Um, so my question is, I'd like to hear your comments about the limits of identity politics that so many young people seem to gravitate towards as an analysis to the problems that uh, they are seeing in the world today. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Kit. Hopefully I pronounced your name correctly. Um, yeah, what you brought up, of course, uh, women's oppression is part and parcel of this society. So I have different ethical 
issues in terms of um, my voice and uh, what's impacted me from, um, like, like I said earlier, the true heroines are my sisters and my, my, my siblings and some of whom didn't make it. They're buried six feet under. Um, the oppression, the trauma was, was too much. So how am I a voice for them? And, and that's, that's what that book looks at too. Um, my son blazes within me so many contradictions, so little time. I'll put a link there in the, the chat so people can check it out. Yeah, identity politics divides us. Um, and it, uh, I, I think, yeah, we, we see how they're using identity politics now. You know, Lloyd, Lloyd Austin is the Secretary of Defense. What does that mean to the besieged people of the globe that the, the Secretary of Defense whether it's Colin Powell or Lloyd Austin and 33 women, 33% of the cabinet picks so far by, by Biden have been women. And I think 40% people of color from oppressed backgrounds, right? So the ruling class can spin on a dime. They're very flexible. They're very class conscious. I think one of the most important memes that I've seen in social media um, these past few weeks is something uh, that I've really tried to hammer home on Telesur and Hispan TV and RT is um, the meme where Bush is bombing the world, the Middle East, South America, Bush is bombing with whatever slogan Bush had back then. Obama is bombing with um, Si Se Puede, Yes We Can, written on his military jets. And then, you know, Trump with his slogans. And then you get to Biden in the Kamala Harris years and they're bombing. Um, and, and some of those bombs might not be uh, literal bombs, but they might be bombs like Google and Facebook and YouTube. You know, that's how they're gonna try to recolonize Cuba now. They said they're gonna, you know, maybe make this or that tweak in the blockade, but a blockade's still a blockade. So on the Biden plane, it had the LGBTQ uh, rainbow flags. It had the Black Lives Matter slogan. So yeah, the ruling class, I mean, the George Floyd moment, the George Floyd rebellion, which was an international rebellion. How quick was the ruling class? The most random corporations in the NBA, every NBA announcer now had to say, oh, Jalen Brown and this player, they volunteer and they went to a peaceful march. They had to stress peaceful, 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 because the ruling class can be as violent as they want, but God forbid us poor people uh, ever ever defend ourselves. No, that that's against the ruling class uh, ethos, right? So identity politics is very, yeah, is very dangerous, and it dominates even liberatory, quote unquote, liberatory politics. It's it's everywhere. It it divides us. In in my past, I could tell all types of anecdotes with certain activists who wouldn't even talk to me. Um, because of how I appear. And if there's not an open conversation, I mean, can there be black liberation in the US without the role of working class white people? Um, and I think <laughs> concretely, no. Um, one of my mentors, mentors who, who passed away, shoot, my mentor passed away, never mind my mentor's mentor, but he could trace back his lineage. He was born in Germany and stuff. So he had actual direct links to Marx and stuff. But he taught my mentor who taught me who they were they were in a struggle against the Klan in the South. And um, you know what Malcolm said, once you cross the Canadian border, you're in the South. Um, so I, I don't even think they're that deep in the South. I think they were actually in uh, Ohio or Pennsylvania. But nonetheless, he said, you see all these, uh, you know, uh, white people, poor white people, they can either turn their guns on us, the revolutionaries, the communists, or they can turn their guns on the ruling class. So Trump got Trump, Trump and Trumpism and, and, and that sector of the ruling class, they got to the poor white people in ways that we haven't figured out how. Now, of course, they have billion dollar donors and they have all the Fox News and stuff and they have centuries of backwardness to build upon. But how do we get to, I got all types of family voting for Trump in, 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 in rural and urban parts of Massachusetts in New York. How do we build with them when, if I even go to Venezuela, when I see them on Christmas Eve, they curse me out before I can even mention Venezuela. They uh, accuse me 
of, um, you know, supporting Pyongyang in random ways. So they're so indoctrinated. There's not even a conversation. So I think you, going back to Raj's point too, I think we have to see an actual economic crisis meltdown. We need a, an economic crisis, a political crisis, a social crisis that can actually spark a pre-revolutionary and a revolutionary situation. As the ways things are, our people are too backward to unite. But that doesn't mean there can't be serious economic rifts um, in earthquakes that then throw us over the precipice. So I'm very hopeful because I know that scientifically capitalism can't sustain any, any semblance of social peace or justice for any of us. So the day of reckoning is, is coming. Our job is to continue to prepare. Thank you. Um, big shout out to Jackie. I think you're from the city. And for those of you who are Californians by um, us Easterners, the city is another place entirely. Actually, my husband is with me. If he wants to say something first. Yeah. I, uh, uh, well, it's a question, really. Uh, thanks, Danny. Nice to finally say hello to you face to face, so to speak. <laughs> Danny and I are in the International Committee uh, of the PSC, as is Jackie. So we we're, we're on a, we see a lot of each other's comments. What uh, is the PSC? Prof oh, sorry, Professional Staff Congress. It's the uh, union of faculty and staff at CUNY. And Jackie teaches it and is retired from teaching there and adjuncts now one course. And I'm retired uh, three months ago from being on staff at that union. So uh, my uh, what, what drew me to this uh, event when Danny's talk here was the formulation of dope plus capitalism equals genocide. And uh, for me, the way I view the future, I believe that uh, genocide is going to be the issue. It is going to be the issue that we are going to have to resolve in a progressive way, or we are going to lose everything. Uh, uh, we can see, uh, I mean, we know historically genocide takes many forms, many facets. Drug addiction is one of them. But I, I believe we're entering an era of a, a qualitatively different, uh, uh, an escalation of genocide and of the genocidal impulse. I think we can see that with COVID. Uh, I don't. I don't think I need to go into the details. People are probably all familiar with that, and I think that's a harbinger of what's going to happen uh, in the very near term. I don't think this is way off uh, from the consequences of climate collapse, in which there will be resource scarcity, and that is when I think we are going to see some real heavy uh, genocide come down. And for me. Uh, in that it has international as well as uh, domestic uh, aspects to it. But locally and in the U.S., for me, that means that Black and Latinx uh, workers and maybe, maybe middle class uh, probably as well are going to be on the front lines of that genocidal assault. And uh, it's not going to be something they can choose or not choose to be because it's going to happen. So uh, my question is, I guess, to Danny, uh, is, is, is do you, you know, what do you think of that? And, and you know, genocide as a, as, a, <laughs> as a phenomenon, where do you think we're headed with that? Thanks, uh, Doug and Jackie, and good to see you both. And thanks for all the, the posts on our, our listserv and the work you've done for uh, decades. And yeah, the work around this campaign, we charge genocide um, in, in trying to bring that to the United Nations. That was one of uh, Malcolm X's uh, last efforts before he was assassinated. Um, I, I hear what you're saying about a more, uh, it sounds weird to say a more or less dire genocide, but I, I hear what you're saying, definitely, with um, the impact on, on the climate, what it means to uh, oppress countries. But in some ways, the genocide uh, is already in motion. When we look at uh, life in the most oppressed communities, in the, in the ghettos, who kills who, 
um, the prison industrial complex. We just saw the rebellion in St. Louis uh, yesterday against the prison system. So there's a term I've heard thrown about. I don't know how scientific it is and how scientific it is. And thanks to everybody in the chat too, who's who's challenging me with the use of some of these terms. Cause when we say imperialism, we should be precise. So I'm, I'm learning, you know, I'm, I'm learning. I'm trying to take notes on every comment and learn from it. Every book recommendation, we're all works in progress intellectually and, and spiritually. Um, so yeah, there's already a genocide in motion, a, a self genocide as, as some have called it. Um, but the construction of poor communities, uh, of course, the black community, not all black communities, but oppressed black communities, um, it's not built to sustain life in community. It's built to destroy. Um, so in some ways, white supremacy can kind of wash their hands. The, the oppression is so sophisticated. Um, if, if gangs are shooting each other down or who mugs who or who goes to jail for robbing who, right? Um, that's what, that's why Huey P. Newton wrote, titled his book, Revolutionary Suicide, because we, we commit reactionary suicide every day when we inject ourselves, when we, when we drink, when we, when we partake in all these acts of, uh, of violence against ourselves and against our, our community. So I'm glad that you're highlighting that term genocide, which is, I think, all too real. Okay, thank you. The um, last person on the stack is Sharon Rose. I don't see anybody else on the stack. So um, if you would like to speak, uh, please let, please raise your hand. Sharon, it's all yours. Um, thank you. Thank you, Danny, for a very thought provoking presentation. Um, I was struck, one of the things that struck me of what you said was, you said you're not invited back to high schools when you tell the kids not to join the military. Um, I had that similar experience many, about 37 years ago when I was still living in Detroit. Um, I knew a lot of teachers, high school teachers, and two of them invited me to their classes. One was inside of Detroit in the black community. And I talked to kids about what it meant to join the military and um, they all got it, you know. It was right after, it was not long after they did away with the draft, which as an anti-war activist, I always, I have regretted for many years that we struggle, we advocated against the draft. It would have happened anyway. It wasn't on us that they did away with the draft. They wanted to, but the ruling class wanted to, but um, resist the draft, of course, but it would be better if we still had a draft in my opinion, because now what we have is the economic draft. But um, then I went to, out to the suburbs of Detroit where to a high school that was almost all white and where a lot of the kids um, came from families that worked in the auto industry. And I said, I did the same pitch and the kids didn't get it at all. The white kids, uh, one of them got up and said, but we have to have a military and some of us have to join it to sustain it because you know what, we need that chrome from Rhodesia, he said. And um, that's all, he knew that because he knew how cars were built. Um, and um, what I know now is that there's enormous, enormous uh, addiction within the military and among people who come out of the military because of the trauma that that experience is. And so I think it's, you know, really great that the um, Veterans for Peace exists and I hope it gets stronger as well as whatever organizing is going on in the military. Thank you. Yeah, the military is uh, an incredibly important front for um, struggle. And, uh, and, and in the chat wrote, uh, uh, is there a relationship between genocide and suicide? I've been thinking about that a lot. Um, that's Anne's comment. And um, I was in a meeting, um, geez, about 48 hours ago with um, some youth, some youth organizers from Belfast. I'm, I'm very close to the Irish liberation struggle. And um, 
the official number of, of dead Irish from the Troubles, the British sponsored Troubles is in the range of 4,000, but you still have uh, veterans um, committing, committing suicide, veterans of that struggle, survivors of that, that struggle in the alcoholism so yeah, we, we've internalized so much. So even though the troubles came out, quote unquote, came to an end with the Good Friday Agreement, yeah, the ramifications in our community. And, and so, so many of our people, to link it back to the veteran struggles, you know, we might not have actually been veterans who quote unquote served. Um, the Congresswoman from Hawaii was always talking about how she served, uh, her name escapes me. Um, Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Gabbett, uh, she always talked about how she served and she was so proud of her military accolades. accolades. Like, who did you serve? You know, that was a disservice. So we have to call things by their, their proper name. Um, but good luck saying that in an in a, in a, in a auditorium in the middle of Detroit or Brooklyn. You should see the faces on some of these teachers. And but you know I'm 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 fearless. You're gonna invite me. You 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 invite the whole package. I'm not gonna sugarcoat it for nobody. So the kids are in the back pumping their fists, and the teachers are looking at one another. And there's a whispering campaign. Word travels uh, fast. I mean, they they even been like job offers. Oh, you'd be a great social studies teacher here. And then they actually hear me the full the full talk, uh, and think about it uh, uh, again. So thanks for thanks uh, Sharon. Okay, uh, Raj, did I see your hand up? Yeah, actually, I, if, if there's time. Please. Uh, but if, okay, so Danny, uh, my, I, my, in my assessment, there is no uh, revival of capitalism in the United States. I think this is the dead end. So, uh, and I agree with you, this is internalization of capitalist oppression upon us that people turn to drugs. And, and, and revolution is the skill. I mean, the question is how to bring it about. Uh, that's not easy. So, uh, but I, I think we are at the point where I do not think the capitalism in the United States or what is its highest stage imperialism can actually come out of this morass. So uh, any thoughts on how the poor working whites who turn towards Trump could be attracted towards the communist ideas, because uh, they would be the powerful force, then uh, a class force, then that can overthrow the system and establish socialism. Any thoughts on that? A lot of, lot of thoughts. That's our life work. And in the trenches of it, it it's not easy. Um, there's a great anecdote from Jesse Jackson's campaign for president in a uh, 1984 and 1988, if I'm not mistaken, um, you know, those were my, I, I would have been six, seven years old then, but uh, there's a great anecdote um, going back to some of my mentors, um, the most backward white workers in Pennsylvania and Jesse Jackson showed up in solidarity with their strike. And uh, the workers ended up believing in Jesse Jackson. And I don't have any illusions about Jesse Jackson, but the, the base, the social base of Jesse Jackson's campaign had revolutionary potential. So I think it's on the front lines of struggle that we can overcome the, the white supremacy, the racism, the backwardness that's ingrained within um, working white people. It will not be easy. That's why I gave the anecdote of my very own sibling. Um, He's not open to a conversation. I remember visiting him and working construction with him. He's been a landscaper his whole life. I mean, he'd kill me for even mentioning him in this context. He would violently, you know, attack me. But, but um, I remember reading Eduardo Galliano and, and reading these books. We were, it was the summertime. We were working landscaping jobs for rich people. And he would just come by and knock the... And I was like already like a young adult. I was like 17, 18. And he would just knock the books off of whatever desk I was using. He would say those, those effing, you know, red books, those communist books. And then we'd be building stone walls and, and brick paths. 
every this is in this this is you know a few years back this is not mccarthyism 1951 every time they would build a stone wall kind of those stone walls that concord massachusetts and lexington are famous for when they didn't like a rock or the rock was jagged they would say this this effing communist rock and they would smash it up so anti-communism raj as you know is the unofficial religion of this country we have a lot of work in, in front of us. I think it's going to take um, seismic, cataclysmic events for the white working class to overcome a lot of that backwardness and realize who their class allies are and that this golfer in chief, this uh, demagogue in chief was not their, their friend. I mean, Trump was all talk. He would always talk this tough game. Where was he? What, did he ever take off his suit? Like he, he's never worked a day in our lives. So I tried to have those conversations with working class whites, but I don't have any like great success stories of winning people over. It's very difficult. <laughs> Okay. That's hard work, and, and you've um, explained that many times, so thank you. Um, Gene, how about a comment from you? Yeah, um, since the topic of my favorite organization, uh, aside from the Institute here, came up, uh, I, I, um, we have a local chapter of, of Veterans for Peace here in the East Bay. And um, <clears throat> you know, I joined the Marine Corps back in 1957, got out in 1960. So that was after Korea <clears throat> and before Vietnam. And this wasn't the brightest thing I'd ever did, but it wasn't the dumbest either. But the upshot is, uh, you know, I never had to go into combat. And, I, and as I tell people, you know, I may be an atheist, but I still thank God that she never sent me into combat because I've seen what that does. Uh, you know, we have a local chapter here most of them are Vietnam era uh, vets. And when we go around the room and talk about things, they all have various aspects of PSD. We have one guy, he was in Vietnam killing people, being shot at and so forth. And it wasn't until 10 years afterwards that he was hit by the whole thing. And he just lost it. I mean, he um, lost his job, lost his wife, lost his family, was homeless for about 10 years. And uh, it took that amount of time for him to put it back together. And now he's one of our best activists in not only uh, homeless vets, but also departed vets. And we have another guy who's my age. Um, and uh, he was in the Air Force and his job was as a navigator for these bombers. And his job was to fly if necessary, to drop an atomic bomb on Vladivostok. Uh, and that hits him. I mean, he's still, that affects him. So I think, um, I just want to give some of the perspectives about what people go through in the military. And as, as I said, just thank God I never had to go through that. But I'm very sympathetic to my comrades. It's not only men, it's women also that have those problems. So I'll just mention that. There's so many important connections because uh, the, the biggest sources of PTSD in our society crisscross these very lines. The, the gender depression and, and, and the military. I mean, where does the PTSD come from? So how do we unite uh, along those lines? And um, yeah, I, I, I'm not a veteran of, like I said, of, of the US military. I'm a veteran of uh, other struggles. I've got important training when I lived in the Caribbean and Brazil. I, I, I moved to Brazil, the, MS, the MSA, largest social movement in the history of this, this hemisphere, 1.6 million members, the movement of the landless. And I learned so much from those, uh, those, those different movements, such important um, training. How do we bring this internationalism to our to our dialogue? And veterans, yeah, the veterans, veterans for peace and uh, march forward, the different active groups, um, their testimonies are so, so powerful. That Winter Soldier, when they did the Winter Soldier testimonies a few years back um, after the, you know, based on the, the Vietnam, the resistance to Vietnam, half a million troops, who, who the Vietnamese people who defeated US imperialism as, as well as soldiers here at home who mutinied. Um, 
So when we saw uh, 25,000 troops, some still in DC, mostly black and brown, you know, the, the revolutionary potential of the military. Oof. Hopefully everyone's seen that documentary, Sir No Sir, one of my favorite documentaries to share with my students about the veterans during that time. Um, now the police force, oof, they, they're, they're the reactionary ones with more of a fascist ideology. How do we win them over? Oof, that's a different class. They come from a different class character. That's almost a different battle. Okay, thank you. Um, we're getting close to the end of our formal program. Just, we may I quickly comment on Danny's last comment? Um, let, let me just fin fin finish this. Um, and then, yes, uh, I, and then I think Norman's going to speak. So, or, or is, do you feel that you, you need to come follow exactly? Well, just a very quick, quick comment. Okay. Yeah, uh, so, I just want to say to Danny, if you're telling me now to do it, uh, that I don't think police can be brought in on this side. I think that was true also in the Russian Revolution. The soldiers could be, but not the police. That's okay. generally the thing because. Uh, the, the there. Anyway, I'll leave it there because time is short. So Mike. that's a good question, Raj, and one that we we need to explore further. Um, so the next questioner is um, Norma, and then um, usually what we do is um, end the formal program and then unmute everybody and have a kind of open discussion for the last half hour. Um, so. Um, I'll ask Norma to ask her comment or question, and then um, Danny can respond, and then then I'll ask Danny to kind of make a summary statement as well. So, Norma, you're, you're on. Thank you. Hello, Danny, and thank you for the presentation. And hello, everybody. I've written uh, uh, tracts into the chat, <laughs> which uh, somebody might have seen and uh, needs to see, I say. Um, I have, uh, I'm a member of the Communist Party here in, uh, Berkeley area. Oh, by the way, I went to, um, uh, uh, what town, Austin in 1988 to help the Jesse Jackson campaign, uh, out of control. Well, he stood up here at one of the events uh, at a place called La Pena and said, U.S. out of El Salvador. I was at his, I was at his feet. <laughs> yes, sir. Regardless that it was Democratic Party, which some of my uh, cohorts chewed me out about. Anyway, uh, the uh, last meeting that the local Communist Party group had was to try to work on what we need to do in order to carry this, uh, the ideas forward and, and promote them within the Lumpen who already think those things but don't know it, <laughs> um, you know, in order to organize. And uh, I said uh, that what we need to do is advance every idea uh, that's positive about China, even about Russia, where people are still revolutionary, and about any of the uh, left going efforts throughout the world that are having difficulty rising, giving, given the strength of the Imperium. We need to say positive things about about those efforts. Uh, they have been maligned. In fact, one of the leftist people that posted to some list or other that I get information from uh, was talking about uh, um, equivocating, equivalent, <laughs> equalizing, agreeing that, uh, that those places are like the United States, like the Imperium. And people have got to understand that everybody else is not imperialist. China is not imperialist. Russia was not imperialist. People in Doesn't struggle, that people need to talk up the left struggle that is so 
hugely in opposition to the imperialist imposition of the horror that we all support by not defending our positions, by not telling people, you are a communist. You already want health care and uh, all kinds of care. Well, you want us all to be able to give us each other care and not have to resort to charity. You know, there's no charity in Cuba. There's care and we can do that. And that's why the Imperium hates them and fears them. And we need to talk it up. And it's been mentioned here that, that that's our organizing job. And it is without relenting, without saying, yeah, they, you know, the, uh, China is uh, not satisfactory. Uh, the uh, leftover Russians are not satisfactory. They're satisfactory. Their struggle is evident and needs our support and, in order for us to- Yeah, no, those, those are important comments I look up to. Uh, you all, because of uh, so much experience, I'm a, I'm a constant student. So all the comments here, um, you know, technology nowadays, you can download the comments so I can save this uh, file and I can read these books. You know, I, I always tell uh, comrades, we're just getting started. Um, we get younger every day. We get um, wiser every day and we find more and more ways to, to struggle. Um, whenever I'm in Venezuela or Cuba, I, I find myself saying, you know, just thank you. Ustedes son el ejemplo. You all are the example. And um, it's a different context, but I, I say that to you all as well. You all are the example. Um, in long uh, records, like, like Gary was saying, uh, long rap sheets. Of, uh, of class struggle. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you so much, Danny, for, for joining us. Uh, you've left us with a lot to think about and hopefully you'll, you'll come back and, 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 and help us some more to think through these really big questions. Um, right now, what we usually do is unmute everybody and just make it a, an open discussion. And, and Danny, you're more than welcome to stay if, if you have the time to stay with us for another half hour. So um, this is no longer moderated. So I'm just going to open it up. And whoever wants to speak, please speak. Does any, anybody want to kick, the, kick off the open session? Yeah, Gene wants to just point one thing out. A lot of people have pointed out uh, that if the uh, January 6th events had been black people doing that, it would have turned out much differently. And if you look back in history, after World War, their World War I vets had books called the Bonus March on Washington, and they occupied a lot of Washington, and they were treated much differently also. Uh, then General of the Army led the, led the troops. It was uh, Douglas MacArthur and his uh, chief of staff. Uh, Dwight Eisenhower. They killed uh, a couple of vets uh, in clearing Washington and drove the rest out militarily. So I think uh, they, they don't like anybody uh, screwing around with Washington, but I just wanted to point out that little bit of history there. I'm done. Institute for the Critical Study of Society at the Niebuhr Proctor Marxist Library receives no corporate funding, nor do we have any paid staff. We rely on the support of working class folks that share our commitment to the socialist legacy of Karl Marx. We continue to need funds to meet necessary expenses. Since we can no longer pass the hat at our in-person forums, Please send contributions to our treasurer, either online via PayPal or by check. The PayPal ID 
is ICSS Sunday S U N D A Y at yahoo.com and the name is Richard Fallenbaum and checks may be made out to Richard Fallenbaum and sent to him at 1225 Nielsen Street Berkeley California 94706 Fallenbaum is spelled F A L L E N B A U M to donate directly to the Marxist Library Send a check to the Nebro Proctor Marxist Library at 6501 Telegraph Avenue, Oakland, California, 94609, or di directly or donate online at www.paypal.me slash npml. Info for information Write to, to npml at marxistlibr.org and the website is marxistlibr.org.